Well, welcome to church, everybody. I'm going to invite you to stand on up, and we are going to jump in to a time of singing. Let's do it.
so good to be singing together. Like Jeremy said earlier, we're, we're glad that you're here. If this is your first time to our church, we hope that this place starts to feel like home. We're gonna sing a few more songs. But you know, in the book of Revelation, there's a verse that says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. And I think a lot of times we can sing words or say words and not fully know what we mean when we sing them. And I think it's important to acknowledge what we mean when we say that God is holy, is that God causes us to experience awe and wonder. And he is worthy of praise because of who he is, how he loves us and everything that he's done and will continue to do. And when we turn our focus to Jesus together in this time where we have the opportunity to give him our full attention together and to worship him, no matter what our circumstance is, we acknowledge that he is worthy, that he is perfect to us and that he is holy. So let's sing together.
who wants a relationship with us, the kind of savior that is accessible to us so that we can have a personal connection, that we can relate to you. And thank you for seeing your pain through to the other side for us. Jesus, would you help us not to take that lightly, never to take it for granted. But sometimes when we lose sight, would you remind us of who you are to us, how much you love us, Jesus, maybe some of us are in a really hard time of life right now. And I wanna ask that you reveal your presence to anybody who's struggling, anybody who feels alone in what they're facing. Would you let them know that they're not, that you are showing up for them in their life, that you love them, that 
you want to be with them, that you want a relationship with them. Jesus, thank you for how you are intentional with us and how you love us. Everything that you've done for us, we want to lift up this time to you in your mighty and in your merciful name. Amen. Hey, so good to sing with you. Go ahead and grab a seat. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us for Eagle Brook Online. My name is Jeff Dodge. I'm the online campus pastor, and we are a church whose mission is to reach people who are far from God. And one of the ways that we do that is by overcoming cultural stereotypes of what church is. Like, churches are judgmental. Well, we do our best to love and welcome people regardless of the way that they look, the way that they vote, or what they believe about God. Everyone is welcome here. But church is boring, and it doesn't apply to my actual life. We put a ton of effort into making our services engaging and relevant to what you experience from day to day. And my favorite is that churches just want your money. For this one, there's a little bit of tension for me. I grew up in a church that would twist what the Bible said to promise people wealth and success and a brand new BMW if they just gave. So personally, this one has a little bit more sting on it. So what do we do about it? Well, if you were at one of our campuses, you'd quickly notice that we don't pass a plate or a bucket during our worship services. We don't want anyone to be pressured or guilted into giving. But on the other hand, we're a church, and we believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, and we do our best to carefully and faithfully follow the example that Jesus sets for us in Scripture. And being generous with our time, talents, and resources is one of the core teachings of Jesus. So much so that living generously is one of our five values at our church. And so I just want to take a second to say thank you to those of you who give to Eagle Brook and actively live this out. We are humbled and grateful that you would partner with us and support the ministry that happens in and through our church. And maybe you've never given and you want to you want to find a place to start. I would encourage you to go to eaglebrookchurch.com slash give. We are doing a three month generosity challenge. And if you participate, will God get you that new BMW? Probably not, but it will loosen the grip that money has on our hearts so that God can teach us to live generously. Also, I want to give you a heads up that after service today, we're hosting a live webinar called Closer Look. This is our chance to be as transparent as possible about why we do church this way. And if you have any questions about what we believe, we would love for you to join us. It's only 30 minutes long. And to join, you can go to eaglebrookchurch.com slash live and click on the closer look tile once this service is over. It is a webinar, so no need to change out of your comfy clothes. You'll be able to see me, but I won't be able to see you. And with that, I hope you enjoy the rest of the service. In 2015, Valley Fair, which is an amusement park here in Minnesota, opened six new water slides. Here's a picture of those water slides. The two on the left are called Breakers Plunge, and they are 90 feet in the air. The four on the right are called Breakers Pipeline, and they are 65 feet up in the air. Our family visited Valley Fair just a few years after these were opened, and my two oldest sons somehow talked my wife into going down one of these body slides with them. This is very out of character for her, but she was feeling adventurous, and so as they were walking up the stairs, she stopped one of the lifeguards who was walking down, and she said, which one of those slides is the least scary? And he had to think about it. He was like, oh, let me think, maybe the red one. That should have been their first clue. When they got to the top, it wasn't a normal body slide where you grab the bar and kind of swing yourself down. No, you stepped out on a platform, and you would hear a voice that said, five, 
four, three, two, one, and the trap door would open under your feet. You would then be in a free fall for the first 10 feet until your back smashes into the slide and then you're on your way. And so my son, Micah, he was about 11 years old at the time. This is about seven years ago. He looked at my wife, Sarah, and he said, I'll go if you go. But just to make sure it was safe, he made his younger brother, Hudson, who was eight, go first. <laughs> Sacrificial lamb, right? If, you, if you're the younger brother, you've had this happen. It's like, let's just try this out first. So Hudson steps out on the platform, five, four, three, two, one, boom, trap door opens, down he goes. Micah steps out, five, four, three, two, one, door opens, down he goes. Sarah steps out, five, four, three, two, she goes, hold up. Stop it. I'm not doing this. And then she had to walk all the way down the stairs past the line of people. It's like the walk of shame. And I was poking at her a little bit. I was like, did you fist bump the 12 year old girls who were waiting in line to go on this thing while you headed back down? There are slides like that in life. They look fun. They look exciting from a distance. But the closer you get to them, you realize, oh, oh, wait a minute, it's a trap. That's true for today's topic, which is sexual sin. The me you don't want people to see is oftentimes related to some sort of sexual sin in our life. It was some sort of trap door that opened that we were like, that looked fun, it looked exciting, but the moment you went through it, you thought, wait a minute, so this wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And for a lot of people, it's not even sexual sin that they themselves committed. Oftentimes, it's sexual sin that was committed against them. When I talk to people about this series and I say, what's the embarrassing part of your life, the awkward part, the me that you really don't want other people to see? I heard stories about sexual sin that was committed against them. And maybe that's you. Or maybe you're a person who says, you know, I'm actually the one who committed the sexual sin. I'm the one who walked up and went through the door on my own, but now I have an immense amount of regret. And I want to remind you that there's only one person who's ever walked on this planet who has lived a completely pure life, and his name was Jesus. That means that you have sexual sin in your past, I have sexual sin in my past, and my hope is that God could use this message to begin to bring some healing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, here's what Paul says about this topic. He says, flee from sexual immorality. D don't even get near the trap door. Because when you get near the trap door, you're, you're not sure exactly when it's going to open. He says, flee from sexual immorality. When the Bible says sexual immorality, it's generally speaking to sex outside the context of marriage. And some of the other things that lead up to that and go along with that. He says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside of the body. To which we tend to say, well, I can do what I want. It's my body. And I believe that, that God, the Bible, would respond, yes, that's precisely the point. It is our body. But the person that sexual sin hurts as much as anyone else is us. It's you. It's me. And so Paul goes on in the next verse. And it's almost like he's anticipating our objections. He says, I have the right to do anything you say. Apparently, that's not just a phrase we use in the year 2024. Apparently, around 45 AD, in the city of Corinth, people were going, I can do what I want. I can do anything I want. You, you can't tell me what to do. I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. So yeah, you, you have the right to do it, but is it going to be good for your life? Is it going to benefit you? That's the question we all ought to be asking. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? So he says the temple is not something in Jerusalem that you go to. 
It, it, that's not where the Holy Spirit dwells, that you got to get on a plane and fly to Jerusalem and go to the temple of God, and that's where you experience the fullness of God's presence. He says, since Jesus, when we put our faith in him, we receive the Holy Spirit as a gift from God. And the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our bodies. He says, our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit. You are not your own. You were bought with a price, which was the life of the Son of God. Therefore, he says, honor God with your bodies. I see two ways in this verse that we can honor God with our body. And my hope and prayer for you in this message is that God would begin to bring some healing. That God would begin to bring some forgiveness and some freedom into our life. Here's the first way to honor God with our bodies, and it's this. Don't let lust trap you. So Paul says, I've got, we, we say, I've got the right to do anything, to which God says, do not be mastered by anything. Let me ask you, is there something in your life that started to master you? It's just taking over your thoughts. It's taking over your desires. You can hardly think about anything else. Oftentimes when we say, I can do whatever we want, can we? Can, can we do whatever we want if we're controlled by something, if we're mastered by something? The irony of us saying, I can do whatever I want, is that oftentimes we really can't do what we want. If there's a sexual desire in our life that started to take such a control that we begin to do things that we don't actually want to do. We become trapped in a self-made prison. My dog, Augie, is cute. Here's a picture of Augie. He's a cute dog, but don't go, oh, too long, because he's a hoarder. <laughs> he is a straight-up hoarder. He will find food or wrappers, and he'll bring them back to his crate, and he'll sit in there, and he'll just cower over them. And if you try to reach in to grab the food or grab the wrapper, he will snap at you. He will growl at you. One time, he found an RX bar, a protein bar, in the wrapper. So he couldn't even eat the thing. Couldn't satisfy his desires, but he drags this thing back to his crate, and he spent the whole day sitting on it, covering it, growling at you if you got close to him. Could have been out getting a belly rub. Could have been out on a walk. Could have been chasing the kids around the living room, but instead he sat protecting this thing that couldn't satisfy his desire. Just think about that for a moment. He's protecting it because of his desires, but the thing that he's protecting can't satisfy his desire. Sexual sin is often the same way. We tend to think because of our desires, I need this thing, I have to have this thing, and if anybody else comes along and says, I don't think you should do that, we growl. We might even snap. We get a little defensive. We're like, hey, I can do what I want to do. But oftentimes our desires are never satisfied. The sad part about sexual temptation is the more you tend to want, the more you tend to crave, and you're never quite satisfied. Think about pornography as an example. Here's what pornography does to a lot of people. It makes real life, real life intimacy difficult because you're used to being in control, and then you add another person to the equation, and now all of a sudden you're not in control, and you start to get nervous. What pornography does is it sets unrealistic expectations. Now you start treating this other person where they're going, do you really love me? Do you care about me? Or are you just kind of here to use me to satisfy your, your fantasy? And you start creating these unhealthy, unrealistic expectations that can never be fulfilled by a real person. Now, when I used to talk about this, you know, 10 years ago, there would be pushback and people would say, oh, there's this purity culture in the church and all these kind of things. You know, I can look at what I want to look at. I'm not hurting anybody. But I've noticed that secular culture has started to swing around on this. I just saw a post on social media where someone said, nothing good comes from pornography. And they were speaking to men and they said it makes men complacent and distracted. It kills testosterone it takes away natural desires and drives. It hurts your sense of purpose in life. They said nothing good comes from it. Now, my goal in this is not to shame men or women. And by the way, this is not just a man issue. I talk to people all the time who say to me, I'm telling you, I want to stop. 
I mean, it's it's not that I even want to do this, but somehow I've got this wiring in my brain and I've tried to stop and I can't stop and I fell back into it again. And I just want you to know if that's you, you are not alone. But healing is possible. And it starts by telling another person what you're struggling with. And I realize at the moment I say, like, oh, my God, it's like the last thing I wanted you to say. Because this is the me we don't want others to see. This is the embarrassing, awkward, shameful parts of our life that we don't want to talk to other people about. But I just want you to know, whenever someone has confessed to me that they are struggling with pornography, I don't feel any kind of judgment or shame towards that person. I admire them. I admire their courage. I admire their humility to be open about their struggles. I admire their desire to be set free. I have only admiration for a person who would do that. But you've got to tell another person and ask them to help hold you accountable. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 3 says this. It says, but among you, there must not be even a hint. It's an interesting word. Even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. It says there shouldn't even be a hint. Well, what, what's a hint? Is sex outside of marriage a hint? Yeah, I would say it is. Is fooling around with your boyfriend or girlfriend, is that a hint? Yeah, I think that probably is. Well, what about flirting with your coworker and telling them about how frustrated you are in your marriage and you know what you're doing? Is, is that a hint? Yeah, I, I, I think that can be a hint. What about living together? Because people today are like, well, geez, I mean, everybody's living together. And if you've seen the economy, like, it's the only way we can even afford to have an apartment. But when I talk to people who are living together, I take them back to this verse, flee. Flee from sexual immorality. If you live together, you're, you're not fleeing. You're getting as close to it as you possibly can. Even if you're pulling back, you're going, oh, yeah, I'm getting as close to this as I can. You're certainly not fleeing. And the statistics show that couples that live together before marriage, if they do in fact get married someday, 80% more likely to have their marriage end. 80%. I mean, even if you're a person who's like, I don't really know what I think about the Bible, if you just look at the numbers, you would say it doesn't make sense to live together before marriage. And so when I'm doing a wedding for a couple that's living together, I will sit them down and I will say, before I perform this wedding, before I participate in it, before God, I want God's best for your marriage. I want God's blessing on your marriage. Would you be willing until your wedding day to abstain and make other arrangements? And I've never had a couple turn me down. Every single time they look at me and they go, you know what? You're right. We, we absolutely will. We want God's best. We want God's blessing. We will abstain. We will make other living arrangements. And I'm telling you, that's hard. Because when they leave that meeting and they go tell their friends, their friends roll their eyes and go, that's ridiculous. Are you kidding me? You're just going to move out for like how long? I mean, this is crazy. But I love that they have the willingness and courage to do that. Because not everything that is culturally acceptable is accepted by God. Don't let lust trap you. Here's the second way to honor God with our bodies. And it's just one simple word. And the word is this flee. Let's go back to first Corinthians six again, flee from sexual immorality. All their sins a person commits are outside of the body. I was watching Daniel Young, who's our student ministry pastor, and he was giving a message and he talked about Lutzen resort up on the North shore. And I don't know if you heard this or not, but there was a fire this fall and Lutzen burned to the ground, the whole resort which was devastating for people who love the North Shore here in Minnesota and, and love Lutzen. But in his message, Daniel asked this question. He said, imagine that you were staying at Lutzen that night and all of a sudden the alarms go off. And you can see the flames and you can smell the smoke and you wake your kids up. What's the first thing you're going to do? Would you grab your kids and go, kids, go fill up some buckets with water. Let's get some blankets. Let's go fight this thing. Probably not. Most likely, you're going to wake your kids up and you're going to go, kids, grab my hand. We've got to run. 
when it comes to sexual temptation, the Bible isn't asking us to fight the fire. The Bible is saying, flee from the fire. Don't get as close to it as you can and then go, well, I'm just going to battle and struggle and fight against this. Run in the opposite direction. Up here with me, I have a fire pit. And if I were to light this on fire, it would bring us warmth and it would bring us light. Our facility staff would not be happy with me, so we're not going to do it. But if I were to light this, we would be fine because the, light, the fire is contained, it's constrained. But if I were to walk over here on the platform and I were to set this wood on fire, it would bring us warmth, it would bring us light, but it would also begin to bring destruction. Sex outside the context of marriage is similar. Within the confines of a covenant marriage relationship, sexual intimacy brings light and warmth and intimacy into that relationship. But outside of a covenant marriage relationship, it can bring pleasure, it can bring fun, it can feel good, but it also can bring destruction. When I was in high school, I had good friends who were dating and they had one of those relationships that you're like, oh, I wish I had that relationship. I mean, they just had such a cool relationship with each other, and then they had sex. And I wasn't even a Christian, but I watched this, and I remember thinking, they're changing. All of a sudden, they got jealous. So he'd talk to another girl, or she'd be talking to another guy, and they would get controlling and jealous and start to fight. And they were clingy with one another, and they were needy with one another, and the emotion was just running over all the time. What happened? Well, they experienced the oneness, the emotional, spiritual, physical oneness, but they had no constraints around their relationship. Marriage is not just a piece of paper. Marriage is a covenant before God. It's a promise. You can't just grab your toothbrush and sneak out from a one-night stand and go, maybe I'll see you again, maybe I won't. You can't just say, well, you know what, I'm going to pack up my things and move out and we're not going to live together anymore. It's bigger than that. Some people think God is against sex or that he's, nothing could be further from the truth. Sex was God's idea. Sex was God's design. But oftentimes a good thing used in the wrong way can become the wrong thing. And so God says, I love you and I want the best for your relationships. And so when it comes to this issue of sexual temptation, you need to flee. I want to talk about a topic that I think many people in our church, this is the me that you don't want other people to see. This is the thing that you would say is the most embarrassing, most difficult thing that you would want to talk to another person about. And you think you're alone and you think other people aren't dealing with this. And I want you to know that that's simply not true. And, and the issue is abortion. And it's a difficult topic to speak on because it's become so political, and most things in our world today tend to become quite political. But I want to ask you for a favor as I'm teaching through this. I want to ask that you not read politics into what I'm saying. Because I'm not speaking on this from a political standpoint. I'm a pastor. I'm not a politician. I'm concerned with people's worldviews. I'm concerned with what God says. And I want to speak to the people in our church who have had an abortion and don't feel like they can talk about it. And I want to speak to the people in our church who have thought about having an abortion or might think about having an abortion and, and want to know, like, well, what does God say about that? So what, is people, what are people saying about the issue of abortion these days? There's a man named Brian Krasenstein. He's a political commentator who has a lot of followers on social media. And I ran across a post where he said this. He said, it's not a baby until it's born. Science shows that a fetus develops the ability to feel pain around 22 weeks. They develop a conscious, conscience so shortly after. Before that point, he says, scientifically, they are not much different than a starfish or a tree. He then says, a little bit later, I don't want your religion telling me what is right and what is wrong. Another person on social media, his name is Nate McMurray, said this. He said, I'm afraid of insane preachers 
who think that a fertilized frozen egg is the same as a baby. Now, let me just address both of these because I think they do represent what people are talking about in our culture today. And, and first off, let me say, I don't actually care what a preacher thinks. And it might surprise you given the profession that I have. But I'm not basing my source of truth on any single person, preacher. I'm not even basing it on religion, which oftentimes can be man-made in some way. I'm not basing my beliefs. I don't care what a preacher says or what religion says. However, any more than I care what Brian or Nate says. And this is the problem that we have in our culture today. When you say that there is no God, then logically speaking, you have no objective source of truth. So you're just left with subjective truth. And subjective truth is, well, here's what my opinion is. And subjective truth might be, well, here's what our culture thinks. And let's take a poll. Here's what most people think. But there's no objective truth outside of humanity that we can look to and we can appeal to as our source of truth. And so Brian says, I don't want your religion telling me what to do. And my question to Brian would be, okay, well, then who does get to tell us what to do? Is it you? Is it you, Brian? Is it your opinion? What about culture's opinion? What if we took a poll and to see what most people believe and what most people don't believe? If you look through history, that hasn't always worked out well. If you took a poll in Nazi Germany about certain issues, I think we would look back today and say, well, that's not the moral high ground. So, So it can't be an opinion poll. Is it science? You do know that scientists disagree about some pretty important topics. Sometimes we find historically that we thought this was scientifically true, and then we made a new discovery, and we discovered something different. You also understand that science can't speak into issues of morality. Pure science tells us what is, what's happening. It's observational. It doesn't tell us what ought to happen. It's a different dimension. That's a different discipline. Nate says that we should be afraid of insane preachers. But here's my question. How do we know that Nate is an authority on who's insane and who's not? Maybe he's a little off. Maybe his discernment meter is just a little bit off and he lacks the self-awareness. And so what he thinks is insane really isn't insane. How do we know? See, I'm sharing this to illustrate the mess that we're in as a culture because the moment you say there is no God, there is no objective truth, And everything becomes subjective. And when that happens, Brian becomes God. Nate becomes God. And I don't think you want Brian and Nate to be your God. Any more than I think you want Jason to be your God. There is one God, and his name is Jesus Christ. And Jesus predicted his death and his resurrection. And he didn't just predict it, he did it. And if you're a person who says, well, see, that's where I'm skeptical. I don't know if I believe that because people don't die and come back to life. I would say study the evidence. Study the historical evidence that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Because I think what you would discover is it's not wishful thinking or blind faith that it's based on historical evidence. It's reasonable to believe that that's true. And so if that is true, what did Jesus say? Not what did Jason say or religion say, but what what does Jesus say? Well, Jesus says that the Old Testament is the inspired word of God. It is breathed by God himself. And I want to read to you two verses from the Old Testament. This first one is Psalm 139. He says this to God, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You are not an accident. You are fearfully and wonderfully made by God himself. And so he goes on to say, your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Speaking to the prophet Jeremiah, God says to him, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Brian says that it's not a baby until it's 22 weeks, and up until that point, it's no different than a tree or a starfish. But the Bible says that God knits you together in your mother's womb. In fact, according to Princeton University and the National Institute of Health, life begins at conception. 
when sperm fertilizes an egg and it becomes an embryo, that's when life began. And I'm not quoting from Christian sources or religious sources. You can Google that if you want to. But according to them, scientifically speaking, that's when life begins. You say, well, it, it's not conscious yet. Well, conscious and life are not the same thing. Someone could be unconscious and be alive. Someone cannot be conscious and have life in their body. If that becomes the definition of life, morally speaking, we would move into some pretty crazy ground. Now, oftentimes these views are presented to you and me in either or fashion, aren't they? Because we live in a two-party system, so you got to pick. It's either that or it's this. Are you for women or are you for the unborn? Well, you got to pick. It's, it, those are your two options. And I want to say that Jesus loved women. Jesus was for women. I mentioned this a few weeks ago. Jesus did more for women historically than any other man has ever done before and will ever do again in history. Jesus loved women. He protected women and children. And yet that same Jesus said that the Old Testament is the inspired word of God. And that God formed us in the womb. Do you know who abortion has hurt more than anyone, historically speaking? Women. In other cultures, men who were kind of on an ego trip and wanted workers for the farm or they wanted to carry on their family name, if their wife was pregnant and gave birth, if it was a boy, bring him into the house. If it's a girl, go set her by the roadside. In ancient Rome, people would do this. They would have a girl and they would set the girl by the side of the road, just let it die. That abortion has had a traumatically negative effect upon women. And here's the sad part that many people don't talk about. It takes two to have a baby. Many women I talk to in our church who have had an abortion will say that often there was a man in their life, like a boyfriend, who was pressuring them into doing it. In fact, just this last year, a famous professional athlete who happens to be one of my favorite professional athletes got caught in kind of a scandal. And it was a situation where he had been cheating on his girlfriend and the woman that he was cheating with got pregnant and she sent him a message saying, I'm pregnant. And this woman posted their text exchange online and I just want to read it to you. She texted him, I'm pregnant. He texted back, heck no, can't do this. She said, so now what? He texted back, get an abortion, LOL. She responded, honestly, I had an abortion with my son around two years ago, and I regret it every day. Men, I would urge you, I would urge you to never pressure a woman into having an abortion. If you are at a place in your life where you're going, I don't feel ready to be a father, I'm not responsible to be a father, then, then don't have sex. If you're in a relationship with a person and there's this other person, you're like, well, I don't want to have a baby with them, then, then don't have sex with that other person. Because I talk to women all the time. And I get messages all the time, like an email that I got from a 21-year-old girl years ago. And it was one of the hardest, most difficult emails I've ever received. She said this in the email. She said, it was the most excruciating pain I have ever felt. I could feel what was happening on my insides. As she was having this abortion surgery, she said, I couldn't think of anything else but how God was looking down at me. What could he have been thinking? And then she asked me this question, will God forgive me? And my response back to her was yes. Yes, 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 this is the gospel. This is the good news of Jesus Christ that no matter what you've done, no matter what I've done, that Jesus can take that record of wrongs and he can nail it to the cross. He can forgive us as far as the east is from the west. You need to know this today. Our church supports life both in the womb and out. We, we support organizations that help single moms. We support organizations that help with adoption and foster care. But I want you to know that whether it's an abortion or an affair, whether it's sex outside of marriage or a same-sex relationship or just lust or fantasies, that Jesus Christ can take our shame, that he can take our guilt, he can take the me you don't want others to see, and he can nail it to the cross. 
But we have to repent. We have to confess and acknowledge and turn away from what we've done. I was talking to a member of our staff a little bit, and she was telling me about her story. And she's she's one of our staff members, and she said that when she was about 18, she got pregnant, and her boyfriend was pressuring her into having an abortion, and so she did. She said, I went down to Planned Parenthood. They gave me a couple of pills. I came home. She said there was bleeding and cramping, and on April 29th, the life of that baby ended. She said, after that point, I started to spiral. I I started doing drugs and alcohol and sleeping around. I was looking for love in all these places. And then she said, I met Jesus. And I felt his love for me. And it changed her life. And and she said, I made a commitment right then and there that I wasn't going to have sex until marriage. And so her boyfriend broke up with her. But she ended up meeting a, a strong, godly man. And they got married. And she got pregnant. And she gave birth to a son on April 29th, nine years to the day after her baby's life had ended. She said to me, she said, but God's story of redemption was just beginning because I got pregnant again. And this time the baby had Down syndrome. And 67% of babies that have Down syndrome end up being aborted. And she said, the doctors urged us to do that. I said, well, the baby has Down syndrome, so you know, of course you're going to want to abort the baby. And she said, it was such a gift to have a second chance to look at the doctor and say no. And her son was born in 2016. She sent me an email right before Easter. And in that email, she said this. She said, as I get closer to Easter, I reflect more and more on redemption. And how Jesus has redeemed my life. Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice so that we could all be redeemed in his name. Years ago, I had a woman in our church, a young woman, reach out to me and she asked me this question, should I have an abortion? And she kind of explained her whole situation and she said, I think she was leaning towards having the abortion. And so I responded back and I just urged her to have the baby and make a plan for adoption. And oftentimes when someone emails like that, I, I never really know what happens. They they don't generally tend to email back. But in this case, about a year or two later, I got another email. And she said, I listened to what you said. But I ended up keeping the baby. And I'm raising it now as a single mom. And she said, this is the greatest gift God has ever given to me. And I can't imagine my life without this little girl. And so my wife and I met this woman. We, we got to know who she was. And two or three, four years later, my wife was at Costco. And she saw this woman and her daughter was sitting in the cart. And her daughter was just sitting there. And so my wife walked up to say hi. And as she got a little bit closer, she could hear this little girl singing. And she was singing, Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones, the most weak, the most vulnerable, the ones who can't speak for themselves, little ones to him belong. When they are weak, he is strong. And my wife walked up and this little girl looked at her with big eyes and she said, do you love Jesus? And my wife said, that little girl is going to be a blessing to this world. I want you to know today It's not just the little ones that Jesus loves. He loves you. When you feel unworthy, when you feel unacceptable, when you feel unloved, there is a God who knit you together in your mother's womb. That before you were born, he knew you. And he looks at you and says, I love you. Even in all of our past, even in all of our shame, even the parts of us we don't want other people to see, Jesus sees it and he says, I love you. And I believe that for many of us today, the first step is to receive his love into our life, to repent and to put our faith in Jesus Christ as the first step to having a relationship with him, to knowing him. So if you've never done that before, I want to lead you in a prayer. And if you pray this prayer just after church, take a moment, text the word begin. 
to the number you see on your screen, 77888. I just want to send you some resources to get you started. But I want to lead us in a prayer right now. And if you have a past, if you have things in your past that hurt you and are painful, and you want to give those to Jesus Christ, he'll take them. And in return, he will give you his love and his forgiveness. Let's pray together. God, there are some of us here who have been hurt so bad by this issue of sexual sin. Maybe it was us, and maybe it was something done to us. But God, right now, by the power of your name, by the power and the spirit of Jesus Christ, I pray for healing. I pray for forgiveness. God, I pray for freedom. Lord, for those of us who have never had a moment in our life to say, God, I, I give you all of my past and all of my shame and all of my sin, Lord, would you take it? They're just going to pray right now with the quietness of their mind, Lord, I confess to you. I turn from my old life. I put my faith in Jesus Christ. And I want to receive the Holy Spirit into my body. I want to receive the gift of your grace and your forgiveness through what Jesus did. Lord, what would we do without Jesus? Who takes the parts of us that we don't want any other person to see. He sees it. And yet he loves us dearly. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Hey, if you need prayer for something at your campus, come on down front. We'd love to pray for you. Have a great weekend, everybody.